And thank you, Marlene, um, for the introduction. And um, it's uh, an honor to take part in today's uh, webinar. Um, as Marlene said, I'm a pediatric cardiologist here at the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. And what I wanted to try and do is just to set a little bit of the background to so that when Marlene and uh, um, Julie and Max's mom come to talk that you, I suppose it puts it in context that the work that we're trying to do with these patients. So I'm just going to try and give you a little bit of a, an overview of the, of the issue of congenital heart disease and how the patients come to us and what the important things in monitoring them are. Um, First of all, what is congenital heart disease? Well, like any congenital abnormality, it's one that's present at birth and it has to, it's an abnormality of the heart or the vessels within the thorax. And it varies in its impact on the child from things that are quite mild in some cases to uh, patients like Max, where it has an impact on every aspect of their life and indeed of their family's life. So congenital heart disease is, is probably a bit more common than maybe perhaps people realize. Um, it has a prevalence of eight to nine per thousand live births. And when I'm talking to parents, I, I usually, when and they ask me how common is this, I usually say that it's just, it occurs in a bit less than one in a hundred births. And that puts it in context for them. But interestingly, when you look at stillbirths and miscarriages, uh, congenital heart disease is much more common in babies who uh, do miscarry. And so, in the context of congenital abnormalities, it's the most commonly occurring severe congenital abnormality. How do the patients come to us? Well, um, they come at different stages of life. Um, increasingly now we know about the babies before they're born. Um, in Northern Ireland at present, you know, all moms have an anomaly scan at around 20 weeks gestation. And um, I conduct a fetal cardiology clinic where I see moms where, who are referred in there because there may have been some concern on their anomaly scan. So more than half of the patients that we see and we now know about before birth, and that's a big, big advantage to us because we can prepare for their delivery and stop these children getting uh, sick, perhaps gone home without a diagnosis being made. For those that aren't diagnosed antenatally, um, we then see them, many of them come to us as, as sick babies. And those with less severe uh, disease may slip through the net and be only detected later in childhood and very, very rarely, in fact, go through to adulthood uh, before they're picked up. But the majority of the, pe the people that we'll be focusing on this morning, I suppose, are the fetus and the neonatal group. I just wanted to show you, this is just a, a clip just to show you how, ser how clearly we can see the fetus heart and infancy. This is a fetal echo at a, in a mom at 24 weeks gestation. So we're scanning the mom here and looking at the baby's heart. And this is the heart and the four chambers of the heart here. This is all of the baby's chest here, the spine, the lungs. And this is a, that's, a, that's a normal heart. Um, and But it allows us to, to get a window, if you like, uh, to, to make the diagnosis at that stage. If we don't um, see the, the babies before birth, then this is the way that they often come to us. They may come to us with cyanosis, the sort of classical blue baby, or they may come to us with signs of early heart failure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Or a baby may be found to have a heart murmur just on the routine examination before leaving the hospital. And obviously there are strong associations with some genetic conditions, um, particularly uh, with Down syndrome and in the study that we're doing together with uh, Marlene and Julie and the, and the team at the uh, at UU in the PEXA project we have a number of children with Down syndrome who have congenital heart defects who we're keeping an eye on closely at home. There are other syn syndromes that um, may also be associated with congenital heart disease, Turner syndrome, a syndrome called George syndrome. So we know that when babies have those conditions that we need to look closely to see if they've got a heart defect as well. When we're examining these children, we're looking to see if they've got signs of heart failure. And uh, so the signs in babies are a bit different from adults. And uh, one of the, I mean, babies in our examination and, and treatment of them, it's very different from adult congenital heart disease. It's a completely different condition. Uh, some of the things that we would look out, for instance, on the video links that we're doing at present uh, with the families at home are to see if the baby's breathless, uh, if the heart rate is, is very fast, and when we examine them to see if they've got some congestion in their liver. So these are clues to us that we can pick up 
by seeing them in person, but sometimes we can detect these things across the video link as well. So briefly, I just wanted to, I suppose, to set the context and show you just with some pictures, a few of the conditions that we see. Uh, this is a very uh, important uh, cardiac condition that we see in the newborn where a baby perhaps is born with very low oxygen levels. And the reason that they're born with these low oxygen levels is that they've got this condition called transposition. And what that means in that condition, this is the aorta here, which is the main artery that carries the blood around the body. That would normally be connected to this side of the heart. And the pink blood is the oxygenated blood. So that would normally carry oxygenated blood around the body. But in this condition called transposition, these two vessels are the wrong way around. And so what happens in these little babies is that the deoxygenated blood coming back to the heart just gets recirculated around the body. And so it's a condition that really provides us with an emergency in the newborn period. In the current era, um, these babies can do really well with surgery, with a, a, a procedure called a switch operation. If you went back a generation, 90% of these babies were born and died within a week of birth. But in the current era, treatments are very, very good and these children can survive and, and do very well. This is another condition that, that causes um, uh, cyanosis or blueness in the, in the baby. You can see in this heart that there is a hole here between the two pumping chambers of the heart, between the two ventricles. The lung artery is very small. It's smaller than it should be. And so what happens here is that the blood is obstructed and going out through the lungs and then goes across the other way. And so this is another condition that we treat a lot. And uh, again, over a generation, we now uh, have uh, ways of, of uh, repairing this condition and giving these children a good quality of life. But this is the kind of child who needs closely monitored at home with oxygen levels to see if there's any deterioration that might cause us to think of doing surgery earlier. I want to just show you one more condition. Um, this is the condition that's commonly associated with children with Down syndrome. Uh, in congenital heart disease, we look after a lot of young people with Down syndrome. Uh, about 45% of them will have a heart defect, and this is the most common one that occurs. Um, it's, this is the heart again. Essentially, what in this heart, there are two holes, a hole between the upper chambers, a hole between the lower chambers, and then there's one big valve across the middle of the heart where, in fact, there should be two. Um, I'm just going to, how do we diagnose this? Well, our tool and the main tool that we use in diagnosing all of these conditions is what we call echocardiography, which is essentially ultrasound examination of the heart, and it's invaluable to us. The next little clip um, shows you a, a video of an echocardiogram of a child with an AV septal defect. And if you focus on this, uh, if you can just visualize what I've shown in this picture and then look at the scan, you should see that, that you can see also the, the area of the holes and the valve here. So when we see that picture, that makes the diagnosis for us and allows us then to instigate the treatment for these children. So in general, congenital heart disease and its, its treatment is one of the success stories of modern medicine. Uh, more than 90% of the children now born with a congenital heart defect, we expect them to survive into adulthood and have a good quality of life. And for about 85% of the patients that we see, uh, corrective surgery is possible. But there's a group where we know because the heart is so complex that we will never be able to repair the heart. And that's the group that in fact uh, take up a lot of our, our time and, and work. And they're the group that we've been focusing on quite a lot in, in, the, in the PEXA project with home monitoring during this uh, COVID era. Um, this is an example of, of that kind of heart where there is, instead of being one ventricle or two ventricles in the heart, we just have one ventricle. And when there is only one pumping chamber in the heart, we can never make two. Uh, we have to adapt um, with surgery uh, the, the, the structure of the heart so that it can function. But it's, it, in these patients, it's a lifelong condition and one that uh, will be with these children through to adulthood. And for some of them, that may eventually lead to consideration of heart transplantation. This is a classical uh, condition that, that, that we see, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, when I first started working in pediatric cardiology, um, and unfortunately that's quite a long time ago now, um, the, these babies, we saw them and unfortunately we could offer them no treatment. Um, over the past 
10, 15 years especially, um, where we have developed treatments that can help this condition with a series of operations, three operations over the first few years of life, but we can't offer them repair. And these patients are really uh, fragile. Uh, they take a lot of input from parental uh, care in terms of feeding them in particular is, is problematic. And for us, monitoring to make sure that there's no deterioration with them. And for that reason, uh, we in Belfast and, and other centers have tried to look at ways that we can allow these patients to be at home, but not uh, miss out on changes in their condition. And so that's the context for the work that we've been doing uh, with the PEXA project, which uh, Marlene uh, will talk about shortly. Um, to let you know what we do with these patients, um, without getting into all of the technical difficulties, because there is only one pumping chamber in the heart, we can only use that pumping chamber to pump the blood around the body. This is the very small uh, chamber on the left side, which is not functional. Um, with a very complex operation, uh, the aorta is reconstructed, and then uh, this tube uh, is connected from the right side of the heart out to the lungs. In this period, when these patients have what we call the stage one Norwood procedure, between that stage and the next stage of the surgery is when they're vulnerable. And that's the group that we uh, and other centers across the world are trying to reduce the risk uh, in that period. And the work that, that we've been doing with the Home Monitoring Project is an innovative way uh, to try and keep a closer eye on these patients and see if we can spot any change with them and support the moms and dads, which is in a very uh, vulnerable period for them, a hugely anxious period, as you can imagine. When the patients get to the next stage, um, and uh, um, we do a different uh, procedure to connect the main vein coming down from the head and neck into the lungs. And when the patients get to this stage, they're in a more stable position and we can relax a little bit about the risk with them. And then finally, when they're about four years of age, uh, another operation is performed to redirect the flow from the lower part of their body up to the lungs. And if they get beyond this stage, then we're quite hopeful uh, that they will do well in the long term. But this is a, uh, a group of patients, as you can see uh, from that, that, that need a lot of input from many professions, from doctors, specialists, nurses, dietitians, uh, the clinical psychology team uh, for, the, for the parents, and indeed uh, the family support groups. So it's a really, uh, it's a big, they say sometimes it takes a village to look after a child like this. And for this uh, group of conditions, that's uh, very true. So in terms of monitoring and looking after these patients, um, there are several key areas. Uh, obviously, they're all on medications. Uh, many of these little babies will be tube fed. Uh, so the medications are administered down the tube. We have to optimize the nutrition because their operative risk is very much governed by uh, their nutritional status or at least influenced by it as much as uh, their anatomy. We uh, have close surveillance on growth and in the project we're doing right now, we're trying in the next wee while to give the parents a set of scales, uh, medical grade scales to keep an eye on, on growth of their uh, little child. We use oxygen saturation monitors and uh, the oxygen saturations that we accept in children with some of these children with congenital heart disease would not be acceptable for you know, healthy children, but they can cope with it. But the most important thing for us is to notice changes in that. And so what's new in terms of trying to um, look after these children is the whole concept of uh, home monitoring using telemedicine and something that I've been involved in now for about 15 years. And as the technology has progressed, uh, we initially we had to uh, install video conferencing machines in the patient's homes, and we did that until quite recently. But in the past year, uh, the PEXIP uh, application, which Marlene will describe to you, has become available to us. And it, it is a big, big advance in, in that it, it is a, essentially an, an app that will allow the parents to uh, link with us uh, and our specialist nurses much more easily. But I, I won't go into that. I just really wanted to, to set the context of why this is such an important piece of work and why it can influence uh, uh, the outcome for these children. And these are the reasons, this is the rationale for it as well. So, you know, very much to the fore of this is the anxiety that parents have when they go home. Uh, they're in the hospital initially, surrounded by monitors, specialist team, and then 
they, 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 they go home and, and many pay, parents feel isolated. So we see this as very much a bridge towards what uh, to, to support these parents as well as the medical uh, indications. And as I've mentioned, for us, the, the particularly risky period is often between the first and second stages of surgery for these complex patients. And we want to try and uh, improve our, our management in that stage. For pediatric cardiology services, they're often very specialized services. There is only one uh, pediatric cardiology unit in Northern Ireland here in Belfast. There's one in Dublin. And so this is particularly important for patients who perhaps are more remote uh, in terms of geography from our center. And uh, one thing about these kind of links is that they have no geographical barriers. You can do them, in fact, any, you can link with a child anywhere in the world, which is uh, really something that's quite staggering when you think about it. And so that's, that's really all I wanted to say in terms of, of, of the uh, background to, to what you're going to hear. I hope it helps sets it in context and uh, thank you for listening.